welcome to our production. It's a very celebratory one, so I'm so glad that you're here to join us. My name is Davis Aaron Anderson. I'm Director of Programs and Partnerships at Metropolitan New York Library Council. Um, many of you have heard of us before, but for those who haven't heard of us, uh, we are a multi-tech consortium membership organization in New York City. We serve folks in New York City and Westchester County, specifically working in libraries, archives, museums, anywhere that produces knowledge. So we're so glad to hear, see you all here today. Um, the, the game plan is as follows. I'm going to just give you some information about housekeeping elements. Um, and then I'll introduce you to my boss, Nate Hill, who will sort of set the stage for our conversation today. And then I'll take the reins back and we'll have a moderated Q&A with our two panelists today. And we'll have time for your questions. I'm going to hand things over now to Nate Hill, our executive director, to share more about um, what we're all doing here today. So Nate, over to you. You know, Davis, you really are just the best. Thank you for that. Uh, and thanks for all of that intro. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say other than a giant welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for attending. We're happy to have you here. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. John Gamp and to Dr. Colin Reinsmith for, uh, for, for the conversation and presentation that we're about to have. Um, I'm so excited uh, that we have you know, got this whole new initiative at Metro, uh, the Digital Equity Research Center. Uh, with, with Colin as uh, the founder and director. Um, it's a big moment for us uh, at Metro to step into a whole new program area. And the past year has been such a whirlwind of excitement with the, um, the funding coming from the American Rescue Plan Act and really getting us started on this path toward more and more digital equity work with our members and partners and friends in New York City and all over the place. So um, I'm just, I, I can't say enough how delighted I am to have uh, Colin here and to have this sort of first event in many cool new things that you're going to be uh, uh, part of here. So um, with that, uh, I, again, thank you, everybody. And I'm going to hand it back over to Davis and we can get this thing started. Thank you so much, Nate. Um, good to see you. Um, and thanks for being here and for giving that warm welcome. So yeah, I echo your, your comment that it is a very exciting time here at Metro uh, to start a whole new department on something that we all care so much about. Why don't we start with introductions of our speakers today? Um, as you just heard, uh, Colin and John are here uh, to talk to us more about digital discrimination, digital redlining, and what to do about it. This kind of work comes from a, a place of passion and from the urge to make a change in the world. So I would love for you both to just share a little bit about your background what is that drawing force that leads you to this topic? And uh, what else should our audience know about you um, before we start into our conversation? Um, John, why don't we start with you? And then we'll go over to Colin. Well, thank you all um, very much. And thank you very much, uh, Davis. And uh, thank you, uh, Nate, as well. Um, th this area you know, I, is, is a great concern that I have had for a very long time. I really care deeply about trying to find ways to make sure that anybody and everybody that needs access to information, they've got the tools, the means uh, to be able to do that. Um, I certainly know the value of our community anchor institutions and libraries, in particular, archives, museums, and other places, and just how vital they are to really make that happen. Um, this is a, uh, an area of work that I've, um, I've been focused on in a while. Uh, Colin and I actually go back because uh, he was a uh, doctoral student while I was at the University of Illinois. It's formerly known as the Graduate School Library and Information Science. And I found at the Center for Digital Inclusion, which built on the kind of a, a longstanding tradition at the University of Illinois as a land grant to really try and find ways of taking, uh, opening up access to uh, important problems and issues. And, uh, we, uh, the school created this uh, program called Prairie Net, which was one of the first public access points to the internet as well. And that was kind of the tradition of which the Center for Digital Inclusion was built. Um, but, you know, Colin was part of a group of, um, it was about 12 or 14 of y'all that were part of this program on information and society. And uh, when Colin and I would meet, um, <laughs> you know, I, he was, he was an, I was his advisor initially, but when we would meet, I was taking more notes from him than I think I was helping, um, than I did to help him as well. But it really shows how quickly emerging this area is and so forth. And folks like Colin and others have really done a lot to really advance our understanding about this as well, too. And I met Nate very early on as well, because I had a grant from Institute Museum and Library um, Services that really looked at 
uh, how do we get to the next level, you know, and create what we call these gigabit libraries and so forth. And he was at Chattanooga and we really learned a lot from the experiences there. But today, you know, I'll talk a lot about, um, you know, a lot about this experience um, from building, a, you know, one of the first gigabit networks in the country uh, to really looking at new models of, of trying to enhance digital literacy and, and other approaches to really try and figure out how do we overcome the digital divide? How do we make sure that folks who need access can have it? And how do we deal with some of these sticky problems around digital discrimination and digital redlining? So thank you all very much. Thank you. Colin, how about you? What's your background? What would you like everyone to know today? Thank you so much, Davis. Um, it's wonderful to be with you today, John. And um, also thanks so much, Nate, for that really wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it was really a, an honor to be at the iSchool uh, with John about, I won't say how long ago it was. You know, I think that maybe what would be helpful backing up a little bit for me was before I uh, came to the iSchool at Illinois, I ran a public computing center at a community media uh, center. It was actually a public access television station in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts called CCTV, the other CCTV. And, um, you know, I think that was an incredible opportunity to understand people's everyday experiences not having access to technology firsthand, and as many public libraries do. And that was really my introduction to library and information science before I knew really what library and information science was. It wasn't really until I came to Illinois that I uh, learned about the intersection between uh, the, the needs and the ways in which, again, as John said, our community anchor institutions serve folks who can't afford the high cost of broadband at home or need digital literacy skills or need a device or just support from people uh, in community, uh, community contact. So that was really my first um, you know, introduction to this space. And it was coming to Illinois and meeting John, actually a big part of this, uh, when, when we work together, understanding the sort of the intersection of federal policy and how that connects to folks on the ground who need services, as well as public librarians and other service providers who really work every day to help folks. Um, but then, because this was a research institution at Illinois, the role of research, the role that research could play in this process. So really, it's for me, it's been that intersection of research practice and policy that have really driven my interest to this space uh, and uh, the ongoing challenges, uh, including digital discrimination. So really looking forward to talking more about this today. So thanks so much. Excellent. That's a perfect segue, Colin, because we'd like to know what you're doing now. So now we've got the backgrounds from you. Um, you're here on this channel right now because we're celebrating the launch of the DERC. So I'm wondering if you could give our audience here a bit of a primer on what you're up to and what the center's all about. I understand you have some slides for us. I do. Um, thank you so much, Davis. That's the other reason why I'm excited to be here today um, is to introduce the center. This is our official sort of launch of the center and kickoff. This is the link to the website you can see here on the right. Um, and this is the website. And so you can see the mission of the center here that our focus really is to um, emphasize community-based and participatory digital equity research to advanced uh, social, economic, and racial justice. And we're doing this to be very explicit and you know, putting at the center of our work uh, the historical marginalization, structural inequalities that have led to, you know, the reasons in, in many cases, particularly in, in cities, why we have ongoing challenges with the digital divide. And we're doing that by, by really talking about ourselves as an applied research center. Uh, and as you can see here, you know, that assumes this fact, but also, um, you know, making sure that we're putting front and center the root causes of the digital divide. We know that access alone to technology isn't going to solve all the problems. There's a lot that's been said about that. There's a lot that's been written about that. I think folks in public libraries know that very well because they're, again, on the front lines of this problem and issue. From a research perspective, what we're trying to do is to try to dig deeper and uncover uh, additional narratives and stories and local contexts and communities that can help shed light on the intersection of digital inequality and other inequalities that don't often get talked about as much as we might think. 
And so we're doing that. We have our values that are put, uh, they're sort of bullet point lists that are further elaborated on the website that we really do focus uh, our work on making sure that we're asset-based. We're focusing on, focusing on the assets that exist in communities rather than simply the deficits that we're aware of the power dynamics and relationships between different entities and, and you know, complex relationships and communities. Um, we're also focused on, on respect, respecting people that we work with, but also surfacing uh, relations in communities where respect is a driver actually of broadband adoption in many cases. And I've, through my research, I've, I've seen that and I've seen the role of just appreciating other people and how important that is. And then ultimately that, that we're justice centered, we're focused on equity, we're focused on justice, we're, we're also challenging ourselves. A lot of the principles are, are also to um, hold ourselves accountable as well in this process. And so we're, we're excited to do this work. We feel that it, it, it fills a, a gap in other approaches to this work. And these are three particular areas, just in, in sort of wrapping up before we move on, we're really digging into this idea of meaningful broadband adoption. This is work that, that I've written about. We, there, there's a number of articles and papers and publications that you can read and, and see on the website that uh, further elaborate on these different areas. But public libraries and digital equity, this is obviously a huge focus uh, and important to remind folks that public libraries play a lead role often in promoting digital equity. And then lastly, this, um, this concept of digital equity ecosystems, which, uh, which I have elaborated here. This is um, from a report with my colleague, Susan Kennedy, published by the Benton Institute. We're really fortunate to have the Benton Institute publish this work in 2020 that looked at what we're calling really the, the important interactions in community contexts, um, drawing obviously from ecology and, and socially ecological perspectives, but recognizing that these are really important contexts rather than simply the one-to-one -one providing people access to the internet, that it's really about relationships. It's really about these interactions and so this area of research is, will be uh, continue to be an important focus of our work. So you can learn more about the, uh, the center uh, here, learn more about these different areas of focus. And um, I always have to uh, end any slide deck with a picture of a cat. So there it is. And that's my contact information. So I'm excited to, um, to work with many folks, hopefully, who are here uh, on this event today. And thanks for this opportunity to introduce the center. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, I love that your, your work is rooted in respect. I think that's key. And I don't think that goes mentioned very often. I think that's sort of the bedrock for any successful um, effort is to make sure that you're respecting all plumbers and understanding where they're coming from. So I love it. That's great. Um, so let's get a little bit definitional here today. Um, we're talking about digital redlining and, and digital, um, digital discrimination today. So I wonder if we can just define those terms for our audience and maybe for me. Uh, so, John, I'll pitch this to you first, then Colin, if you want to follow up. Could you just uh, l let us know, what is digital redlining? How is it different from or related to traditional redlining with the, you know, the maps and the, the red crayon and whatever else they did to make sure that uh, low-income folks were not getting housing loans and so forth? And how does the concept of redlining cut across the physical space and into the digital one? That's a great question and been spending a great deal of time working uh, on this. And I just want to also, just to be clear, I serve on the FCC on one of the councils as an uh, independent subject matter expert and advising them. And we are specifically looking at redlining, but my comments today are really for me as in my professor hat and, and, and so forth. So they, I'm not responding to this, uh, you know, based on the FCC and the work with, that we've started working on. But yeah, this is such an important question. You know, we think about it, um, you know, redlining itself is something that, you know, it has origins back into banking and, and mortgages and, and home ownership and so forth, where uh, certain neighborhoods, well, all neighborhoods were coded in um, based on the credit worthiness of the folks that lived there. And that drove um, mortgages, that mortgage lending practices that, that drove insurance practices and so forth. And they marked areas in green that where the conditions were favorable and those areas in red that weren't. That's where the term came from. But, and as you know, the, 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 the areas that were in red corresponded with areas that were, uh, were heavy segregation, uh, low income, uh, non-white, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, we've seen the ravages of that, uh, you know, over time, uh, you know, with 
the way that the physical layouts of cities have evolved, you know, with building interstates and highways that, you know, tear apart black communities and so forth. Uh, we see, low, you know, there's a lot of negative aspects, you know, from that. Now, um, what's really interesting is that um, when you look at our communities today, that uh, a lot of the disinvestment that happened from decades ago still has an underlying influence on some of the patterns that we see today in terms of the availability of access to the physical layers of, uh, of our communication networks that run across our country. We know there's a divide between urban and rural uh, that is you know, shaped somewhat by this, but also um, we know there's other different factors. And so um, part of when we think about access to the internet is access to the physical layer and then we also think about access to all those other parts that go with, you know, with using computers, knowledge, and, and that type of thing. So there's a lot of work trying to define more specifically what digital redlining means and, uh, and digital discrimination. But when you also add on the layer of the, all of what we know and all of what's been uh, done to address discrimination, there's always this question of intent, right? So is, you know, and intent says, well, do the providers of the internet uh, or providers to whatever it is, do they intend to, uh, you know, be explicitly say, you know, we're not going to provide service in this area. And that, that whole notion of intent is pretty tough to argue and, and so forth. But folks are really looking at more outcomes, right? When they're looking at uh, whether it was intentional or it was just uh, negligence or we just didn't really think about it. It's really these outcomes. Are we seeing significant disparities in certain outcomes when it comes to using computers for everyday life? And when you look at the data, you look at the patterns and you can identify all kinds of significant disparities. And the pandemic really brought this out um, to a, a very large extent. And, and so part of the issue is uh, trying to understand how those outcomes ha have happened and then what can we do to uh, really try and address it. And there's really three areas of focus in trying to tease all this out. One is looking at the, the uh, physical networks themselves. Where do they go? Uh, two, it's looking at um, patterns of investments for the training and, and provision of computers, availability of, uh, of computers and things like that. And then a third area, when we think about outcome, you have to also look at the design of the services that are um, leveraging the use of technology. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of emergent biases that happen when we say, well, we're going to put all of the education for uh, content for a school online. Um, you know, how well designed are all those different applications and so forth? And, you know, have we really thought about some of the emergent biases that have come with some of the poorly designed types of applications? So it's a real complex issue. Um, and in some of my own published research, you know, we're starting to look at these three different levels to try and sort all of this out. But um, there's, a, there's a physical layer of it when you think about access points. And then another point to think about too is what types of technologies are being invested within our neighborhoods? You know, are we still seeing investment in the copper or are we seeing investment in the fiber? And it makes a big difference. Copper has kind of reached its life to the types of speeds that we need to be able to enjoy the digital life that we have. Fiber is one where it, you know, we can easily scale and have the speeds and bandwidth that are necessary um, for today and for tomorrow um, very affordably as well. And so where are we seeing those kinds of investments as well? So there's a lot of, and then, uh, and then there's always a question of whether it's fixed wireless, you're connecting directly to it or, or if you're using um, I mean, fixed wireline or if you even wireless to connect to it as well. So, and so there's a geography of, the, of looking at all of these different factors and where we do see areas of pockets and deserts where there's very poor connection or there's a lack of competition. You know, you're kind of stuck with one provider. Um, but the real true test around discrimination that's uh, being considered is um, if I live in one neighborhood can I get the same services at the same price from all the different providers in my neighborhood versus the neighborhood that might be more affluent than mine? And that tends to be a very common test that we see uh, to try and figure out you know, the extent to which that this is going on. So it's a pretty complex problem, but there's a geography to it that has a direct impact on our daily life that you can draw these lines and see where there's pockets you know, of 
dis or lack of investment. And the technical term is unserved or underserved uh, as well. So I'll just pause right there. Yeah, that was a lot of information. So plenty to work with there in terms of your response, Colin. Um, what do you think about what Dr. Gant just said, excuse me, what John just said, um, and what would you like to add? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, no, John, I think, covered it really, really well, including the specifically the complexity of the issue. I think one of the things in, from a research perspective that, that I've tried to do working with um, colleagues in, in Baltimore, there's uh, actually, thank you, Mary, you, you were very helpful putting chat, uh, links in the chat. There's a link to a report called about the Digital Equity Leadership Lab, which is, uh, and this is a link to a paper, the sort of extended version of the paper of the case study that, uh, that was published just this year in the Journal of Community Informatics. And um, that was a, a really, um, uh, eye opener for me, I think, in having the ability to um, again to dig deeper to to connect this history, right? To look at this history uh, of redlining and uh, disinvestment in particular communities, and in this case, we we know it's communities of color in Baltimore, and looking at more recent maps of internet access, uh, the Able Foundation, and uh, working, I believe, with John Horrigan. Uh, did some excellent research over the past uh, few years, and uh, in their report, the Able Foundation, based in Baltimore, this is in Baltimore, Maryland, um, uh, shared some maps of uh, broadband adoption rates or where access to the internet is and where it isn't. And what we tried to do in the paper that we published is to show the maps side by side. This is something that you know many other people have done, other researchers have done this. Um, but we were looking at Baltimore. We were looking at um, you know, efforts, community members who are working on digital equity, passionate community leaders, and putting it in the context of a broader historical context, that's important to, uh, to consider. And I think that's really the, it's important uh, because also the other, uh, the other context, we're gonna talk about the, the proceeding, but um, with the Federal Communications Commission now, um, uh, taking this on, this is this is an opportunity to connect these, you know, unfortunate legacies to present day work and efforts to bridge the digital divide. And so, as John said, I'll just go back. It's a complex issue that uh, involves a, a lot of us getting involved uh, and, and working on. Um, and so, this is an opportunity, really, to to connect some of these dots that we don't often get to connect. Can I just jump into with one other example, uh, another way of thinking about this? And the Baltimore example is really good. Colin and I were in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, we, you know, our university helped build um, a new gigabit uh, network. And you, you know, even in a, in a university town, you know, it was very clear we had areas that were unserved, and this was one of the examples of where you connected those unserved areas first. But there's another side of this too um, that we don't think as much about. There's a really good uh, article, uh, it's some really great research from Dr. Terry um, Friedlein from University of Michigan, who's been looking at digital line, redlining in the financial sector. And think about in our life and think about during the pandemic what happened. I'm telling you, it was amazing that um, all the investments that were made from the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program from 2010 and onward really plant, made fertile ground so that we could, we could survive the way we did during the pandemic. Because we all shifted to being able to help manage more of our life virtually with our phones and over computers and things like that. But think about this, though. There's, there's this hidden thing that we don't think about. And think about it in the financial sector, where when we think about banking, if you were to look out in your neighborhood now, you're going to see a, a significant decrease or disinvestment in brick and mortar places to bank. But instead, we see the shift from brick and mortar to um, virtual services for do all, to do all of our banking. So that seems, okay, that seems uh, part of the way that business evolves. But then now we run into the problem that through this disinvestment that we have zip codes that are high poverty, now, now all of a sudden the, there is no bank that you can actually go to. You have to go online to do that banking. And that's where we run into the other dimension here of the digital discrimination and the digital redlining. Uh, it's, it, you know, there could be great, you know, uh, great access to those particular banks, but within the zip codes where um, there could be high demand for these types of services, 
we see um, significant uh, disinvestment into the brick and mortar and more reliance on online banking and so forth uh, as well. And that really helps to add another layer to some of the complexities in which we've got to deal with um, here as well. I've worked a lot with public libraries from across the country and they, you know, I talk with librarians and say, what are the new, you know, what are folks coming in to do? Uh, and, you know, you find, well, I'm coming in to do my banking. I'm coming in to do my health care. I'm coming in to do my education and so forth, which raises the stakes for our public libraries and our community anchors to be able to help. And so you run into another problem. Are those inst are the institutions really ready and able to really help the shifting, increasing demands that the public has to do these very important private, sensitive types of things in a public setting? And that's just another sort of dimension that goes with this whole notion of digital red line. Uh, one thing that I think gets left out in these conversations a lot is, so folks don't necessarily have the access to do all the services that we now do online almost exclusively, like you're pointing out, John. Um, on the other end of it though, when you're working with these, these technologies are also sort of, they are surveillance and they're collecting data on people. And that's a very, it's a hidden invisible thing that not everyone grasps all the time. Maybe people are turning a blind eye to it because it's just so dang convenient to use these computers. Um, but meanwhile, there's information being collected and um, similarly to the way that redlining proceeded back when people were drawing lines on papers, then these populations become targets. Um, I was reading in preparation for this about the way that um, getting people on digital services all like opened up the doors for subprime um, mortgages to be ads to be displayed only to certain populations. And that was a dimension about the crash in 20, 2009 that I had not considered and one that I found deeply disturbing. So I think this is a multifaceted conversation that we're having. And I think that unfortunately it really has a huge impact on people's very lives and the way that they're able to accumulate wealth or not and how they're treated by greater society for better or for worse. So that's my little, my little note um, in this conversation is there's an aspect of it that privacy really matters as well. It matters a lot. Um, I think that really underscores how big of a problem this, this is. If we think about it, we're accumulating such large amounts of data about our own individual lives. And what is the reason? The reason why is that's the commodity of which our economy is thriving on. The ability to be able to write algorithms that can precisely point things directly to you, Davis, or to Colin, or to anybody in our audience, or myself. And that's a big part of what we thrive on in this market space, but it also it opens the door to these crazy vulnerabilities that are accelerated uh, in communities of color, low income, and, and things like that as well, and places like that as well. So Exactly. So before, we have a lot to cover still, so I'm going to skip to a point where we have a little bit more hope. Um, and so I'm wondering how you both might answer this. How might we respond collectively to the issues that you just raised in service of a more equitable future? So what can be done about this? And John, I'll start with you again on this question. There's a lot that I think we can do. Um, one of the very first things I think about is... Uh, especially with our audience that's here today and thinking about your roles in, in libraries and community anchor institutions, archives, and places like that, you know, you, we, we hold a very special place by serving our communities. So one of the very first things I think is important to do is to figure out ways to engage your community to really understand what are the challenges and problems that they have or the opportunities that are out there and then be able to engage other stakeholders to try and come up with um, you know, solutions uh, and so forth. Um, one of the things that we did at Illinois at the Center for Digital Inclusion, we've worked with a number of different communities around uh, the country, and we start developing these really, de uh, these are deliberative practices and working with community, kind of deliber deliberative democracy type practices to really engage stakeholders to really be centrally involved in shaping all, a, all aspects about decisions about the deployment use of, um, of broadband uh, as well. So uh, I, I think that's a very important place to, to, to be involved. And then secondly, uh, take the lessons learned to think about how can we do a more effective job of designing any type of electronic service that you're thinking about putting it out so that it can really reach the needs of the public. And then, and then not just build it and walk away from it, but build and continually to refine it so that you are eliminating those forms of biases that might be built into the systems themselves. And do it in a way that really brings in the voice of 
the folks you're trying to serve and trying to do this and working with, not for or at or to, but that word with, right, is so important. And to let that be sort of the central tenet of any engagement or any question about uh, the use of technology. I, so often we're seeing, uh, I do a lot of work with digital government and you see examples where the early innovations are a small group of developers uh, are building this thinking they know what the public wants. And it's more of a, you know, you see power and control sort of built into the design of it. And we know about the vulnerabilities of that. And so rather take that mindset of a with, and so that you can really engage with uh, the public, with, every, you know, in, in, in more deliberative. And to me, I think that's important. So, and then lastly, uh, as Colin talked about, addressing the underlying factors that are driving your you know, sense of discrimination. Why is it that I don't feel compelled that if I see somebody who needs food or if I see somebody who needs housing, I see somebody who needs clothing, I can't step up and help, right? What is, what's making it hard for me that I can't you know, uh, love my neighbor like myself, right? W let's get down to those root problems. And so what can we do within our institutions where we work so our institutions are really addressing those kinds of issues um, critically and dismantling uh, structures that might exist within our institutions so that we can be a more caring and be more caring as a fundamental basis and then turn that into the design of their systems or services that we're trying to build. Um, to me, I think that's, that's what we can do. So. Very well said. Colin, what do you make of that and how would you like to respond or add to? Yeah, to only, only to add to, certainly, uh, just building on, on what John was saying. Um, you know, I think, so one of the reasons why I've been so drawn to looking at this work within an ecosystems framework is that we know that oftentimes, I mean, it just like it takes a village, right, to, um, to do a lot of the work that, that, that we're involved with, that public libraries and, and uh, academic libraries and our cultural heritage institutions that serve the public often do that in coordination with other actors within a community. And that I think that one way that we can, and you know, one thing that we've seen from the research that I've done and from you know, many other folks that have um, looked at this issue is, um, is the role within an ecosystem. You know, how can a public library alongside other uh, human services providers, of course, if we're talking in an area large enough, like a city that has multiple um, anchor institutions and organizations that serve the public, um, it's the coalition model of doing this work is very impactful. And libraries from the work that I've done uh, have shown, uh, the, the research that I've done has shown that libraries are playing a key role as conveners of, uh, of coalitions, um, uh, playing an integral role in, in their ecosystems. As you know, and the interesting thing in studying and looking at the, the coalition model is that the role of information sharing, of coordination, uh, within an ecosystem is so incredibly important. It's often the sort of invisible and hidden role that happens in the background, but so key in organizing communities to uh, raise awareness about digital discrimination in a particular community, but raising awareness about a whole host of needs and issues around the digital in communities that I think, you know, essentially what I'm advocating for is to look at the work, which is hard not to if you're already working in a public library, but a lot of other folks don't know uh, who might be working outside of a library that the work happens in, in with community. So as John was saying also, you know, thinking about ways in which engaging people with, uh, in your community in a collaborative way alongside others in your community to, to address this massive, this massive challenging problem. Um, so coalitions, and I think learning and seeing different examples across the country of, of coalitions doing this work um, is a really important way to think about and realize the fact that we're, you're not alone oftentimes. The issue is not gonna be, while every community is unique and has their own unique uh, histories and contexts, what's exciting about organizations like the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and other national organizations that are uh, elevating the work in communities across the country so people can see 
you know, wow, the, these, you know, folks are working on these issues in other communities, and these are the strategies and tactics that they're using. I think that gives me a lot of hope, and it gives other people a lot of just tr strategic direction and opportunities to say, this is how we advocate, this is who we um, want to address, whether it's at the local level or the state level or the federal level in a policy context around issues like digital discrimination, but also just the everyday digital inclusion work that you know a single library alone can't provide all of the services to everyone. So in an ecosystem or in a coalition model, there's a lot more we can do. And so that, um, that gives me hope. And as a researcher, I'm trying to kind of find those examples, elevate them and share them with others so that we can all benefit from the incredible work happening in communities. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, uh, like in five minutes, about coalitions and libraries more generally. But I wondered, Colin, while I have you, um, the FCC is putting together a digital discrimination proceeding. Um, and I wondered if you could share more about that and what that looks like and how libraries have, might have a role in that. The FCC's digital discrimination proceeding has its roots in the uh, Infrastructure Investment and um, Jobs Act, the IIJA or IJA, as I recently heard it talked about, which uh, President Biden signed into law in November last year. And, um, and part of the law tasked uh, the, the FCC with looking at this issue of uh, digital discrimination. But again, it's within the context of access, right? In the way that John talked about earlier, uh, it, you know, it's, it's about access to, to high-speed internet. Um, let me find the exact, um, you know, there's a nice, also in the chat, I put a link to the Benton Institute, uh, where I'm also uh, affiliated as a senior fellow, has a good overview of the proceeding. Um, and they uh, talk about this sort of um, three areas in particular from the uh, IIJA. And so, um, so the IIJA talks about the fact that subscribers should benefit from equal access to broadband um, within uh, the service area of a provider of internet service. Also, um, uh, equal access uh, means the equal opportunity to subscribe to an offered service that provides comparable speeds, capacities, latency, and other quality of service metrics. So when we're talking about access, we're really making sure that that equal access is available in, in the different ways that, um, that are you know, uh, possible to subscribe to in terms of speed and other um, service provision. And then lastly here, again, the Federal Communications Commission should take steps to ensure that all people of the United States benefit from this equal access. So that's really the foundation of the proceeding. And it was really um, now where, where we are as the, the FCC is really looking for the public's help uh, to understand, for example, how do we define digital discrimination, right? Um, we're tasked through, through the law to look into this issue. But uh, there has been an open uh, comment period and actually just closed. It just ended, I believe it was on the 16th, um, where members of the public were invited to, uh, to contribute to respond to a number of questions related to um, digital discrimination, understanding sort of what the, the role of the FCC should be in this process. Um, and I think the thing that is, uh, again, getting back to sort of root causes of the digital divide the thing that gives me hope in this process is really not just about um, technology, that again, there's uh, in the um, digital uh, discrimination proceeding announcement on the, the website, or, um, you know, there's, there's a recognition that the FCC, um, um, that the agency, I'll just, I can share it right here, that there's a quote from their uh, from their notice of inquiry that says that the agency will focus on actions it can take to, quote, eliminate historical, systemic, and structural barriers that perpetuate disadvantage or underserved individuals and communities. So I think that, again, this is a pretty incredible opportunity to think expansively that, the federal, that a federal agency has the opportunity to connect the technology to the social, to look beyond simply the technical aspects of broadband provision to the social realities and community context of people's everyday lives, engaging with technology and to think holistically and comprehensively and to say what is possible, what is in our purview, what can we regulate, what is possible to do, while also recognizing things that John uh, talked about earlier around intent and, and recognizing sort of how do, we, how do you identify that 
and how do you regulate to make sure that everyone truly does have equal access to high-speed broadband? On the federal landscape too, and another, it seems like a subtle thing that's also happened. I'll take 30 seconds on this too. Data is also very important. Um, and data is, 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 is kind of the Achilles heel of this issue. But there's a now, a, a, you know, a five agencies are working together around the data as well. And it's also showing, as Colin's saying, the shared need for multiple agencies to be working together to work on this. So FCC, NTIA, uh, and others now working collaboratively as they're trying to make this connection from the technical side to the social impact side through a policy framework as well. And it's also, and so one of the first outcomes is the new data um, sharing agreement that, that's evolving. Yeah, thank you for adding that. That's an important note. Um, this will be my last one for you. I've of course got others queued up in case we need them, but um, this one's about libraries and coalitions. Um, this is sort of combining my last two questions together. Um, so I'm wondering what is the role of libraries in this task force and beyond? How might they have a, have a voice in these issues? What can libraries do to support um, work against digital redlining? Um, and I think that could include organizing coalitions. And so what advice might you have for library workers who are working with coalitions? So it's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of examples of libraries working in coalitions uh, together. Actually, Colin's work, I think, is, is pretty uh, landmark in really trying to articulate how those structures work and, and providing other you know, particular examples of that. I know from my own uh, experience that uh, you have library systems that are working in partnership. Like here, I'm in Durham, North Carolina. And, uh, and so our, our Durham County Public Library is part of the county system, but they also have a mandate to work across, um, you know, the county system, the, the city government system, and then also with the uh, nonprofits, the civil society sec sector, um, our universities, public schools, and so forth. And in fact, um, we're part of that, and I'm part of the, um, you know, the coalition there. And we're working in partnership because we, it's like a potluck where we're all bringing different parts of resources that are needed to really help community thrive. And so it's a way for us to be able to coordinate all these resources, figure out how to share them, um, figure out creative ways of sharing people where funds might be short uh, and so forth. And really trying to develop a mindset that the coalition can really help figure out how to make essentially a one-stop service within your community. So if anybody has any particular need, uh, we can get the right people to the right places and be able to provide that help. But it also is about capacity building. The nice thing about the coalition that we have is that um, it's a great place to be in a safe space, to talk shop and say, okay, here are the challenges that I'm having with uh, money that comes from the state or from federal money or from local money and so forth. And to try and figure out, you know, how do we maneuver it so we can really, you know, work together and solve these kinds of problems. Um, a lot of uh, knowledge sharing about strategies for teaching data, digital literacy, uh, you know, to different uh, need to meet different needs across our community uh, is evolving. How to work uh, more closely with the school district, where there's a lot of needs from parents to teachers to to um, students uh, and so forth. So those, you know, so it's been, you know, effective um, for dealing with that. And we're having a problem with. Um, shootings and gang violence and so forth. And so the coalition now is coming together saying, how can we be part of another, you know, other coalitions that are dealing with those issues so the digital resources can help with the resources that are trying to deal with the crime and the shooting and the gang stuff as well. So coalitions need to be adaptive. Uh, we need low barriers of entry to make them work well. Um, and uh, really need to be engaged and have an ear to the ground to wherever the needs are and be able to get there quickly. Thank you. Colin, what advice do you have for library workers who might want to work with coalitions or who already are? I think John really, really nailed it in terms of, um, you know, sort of the, the value and the, and the roles. I mean, one other thing that I'll just uh, mention that is just, I think, been very effective about coalitions is that because uh, there are lots of different pieces to this digital inclusion you know, puzzle, digital equity puzzle, where people are doing different things, libraries are doing certain things, other you know, schools are doing uh, their own work and other organizations within a community, that, that oftentimes one of the strengths is that they're not competing uh, in, many, in some cases, or if you see a coalition as non-competitive, you see it rather as like John was saying, it's sort of the information resource sharing, 
uh, the power and numbers that actually one of the roles is to you know bring in funding to different partners who are engaging in different parts of the work. And I think when you see it in that way, that it's a really um, a sort of non-competitive uh, piece because it takes all these different actors to, who are playing these different roles. That's a real strength. So I just advise that libraries can kind of see themselves in the strengths they bring that can augment and complement the, the role of other actors within a coalition. Thank you so much. So we do have a few questions that came in, uh, Colin and John, uh, while you were talking about coalition building and libraries. Um, I'll read the first one. This hits on something you were talking about earlier. Uh, Donna asks, due to the redlining and lack of access to internet, these neighborhoods have been left behind in the need for and the access to computer skills. I see so many people who cannot apply for jobs, do resumes, et cetera, which are mostly now online. So what do you make of that? What can we do to help these folks? So I'll jump in first. Um, that's a great coalition activity um, to really figure out how do we, at uh, first within our communities, let's do a community assessment to really identify where are the gaps. And one of the key gaps is, you know, around computer skills and being able to provide those kinds of services. Who's providing it? Where are we falling short? A nice, um, a, a great solution that we're going to see scale quickly with um, the new funding uh, coming out of legislation are, uh, we're gonna see a scaling of digital navigator programs across our communities. And that's a great place for community, for coalitions to figure out how do we put together a good effective digital navigator program within our community. Digital navigators are those folks that are just like yourself, they care greatly about making sure that anybody who needs to you know, apply for a job, whatever, have the right skills. And let's get the people who have the skills to train and to guide in the right places to help. It's a model where you can set up digital navigators to work in lots of different entry points across your community from your uh, community anchors, your churches, uh, community-based organizations, the private sector can really uh, play an important role in that as well. So that's a great place. And another thing that's gonna be important to do is to help visualize for your community where these pockets are. And there's some new methods that are evolving that are really helping communities to be able to do that when they do this assessment approach. One thing you should know, in the legislation, in order to go forward in your community to receive these federal funds, you have to have a strategic plan for your community. And that digital navigator services is something that will evolve when you go through that strategic planning process as a solution to really be able to help those. But it's a tough problem. You know, I was the research director evaluating the BTOP program and we saw lots of examples where it worked well. Now we're trying to figure out how do we scale this and the navigator programs are, are a great way of doing that. And I'll just I'll just add quickly that um, the other um, the other role of coalitions is to advocate for digital equity plans, uh, particularly you know regardless I would argue of the size of the community or the area and the data that John's talking about that can be gathered can help to inform a strategic plan for for a town a community a city to move forward and that's something uh, that can be addressed uh, around digital skills because it's part of it's considered when we talk about digital equity as the goal, digital inclusion being the sort of work, the activities, digital literacy skills is a key component of that. So it sort of uh, would be embedded in a digital equity plan to address, to be addressed in, uh, in your community. That's a good point. Another question from our audience, Alexander asks, any thoughts on broadband labels being proposed? Oh, I love the question. So what it is that, um, uh, the FCC is working with others to just how we have uh, labels on our consumer products, our foods and that kind of thing. We know calories and the makeup and that kind of thing. Um, more transparency about your broadband service. Um, Colin was reading, uh, it's a little bit on the nerdy side of the legislation, but we talk about quality of service, the speed, the latency uh, and other dimensions, right? And so when you sign up for a service, you wanna know, well, what is the speed that's being offered? What's the latency? Uh, what's the reliability of the service and so forth. So you can have, do a little bit more apples to apples comparison if you have the opportunity to look at multiple um, uh, multiple carriers. So it's a step to try and add greater consumer transparency uh, to it. Now, the question is, um, you know, <laughs> are the metrics really effective? Are they making sense? Uh, is there a lot of... Um, are there asterisks by the numbers there? So you get down into the nitty gritty details. Uh, Cause oftentimes, you know, when we see speeds being advertised, you know, you have to look at the fine print to really understand, okay, what did it mean? How was it measured uh, and so forth. 
So there's a question of whether or not the labels, how effective they'll be. But I think it's a great step forward to improve transparency like we've not had before as well. But you're still going to run into a problem that even with the label, you might be living in an area where you only have the one provider. So you have the very best label, but then how do you, you know, you don't have anybody else to compare to. So there, there's a little bit of a challenge there with the notion. It's not like we're in the, in the grocery store looking at peanut butter and jelly where you've got 10 different kinds of each side by side because we don't have that in a lot of neighborhoods and in rural areas across the country. And I'll just add just really quickly to that, that, um, that um, you know, one uh, area that, John, you mentioned this very, very briefly, and I wanted to get back to it, is uh, the broadband that's provided to public libraries, right, or to our anchor institutions, uh, to schools as well. And that often gets lost in the, in the conversation. It was, of course, brought to more to the, the forefront when we saw people pulling up in parking lots and libraries and schools during the pandemic, but also speeds and quality of service of public libraries. This is an area of research that I've also been involved with that John Gant has advised uh, me on and my colleagues. And so I think that's also something that we can advocate for and make sure that all, library, uh, all libraries have the broadband they need to serve folks who can't afford it at home. And so labeling or having more information about what the actual service is that even public libraries also have is, is incredibly important in this context. Yeah, thank you both so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Davis. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone.